Thank you, Matt, with that build-up. So, Matt, Matt mentioned Brexit. What, what, do you, what do you think about... You? How are you going to vote on June the 23rd? I, I don't know. How am I going to vote? Yeah. Probably won't. You won't vote? No, I doubt it. You doubt it? If you were going to vote, how would you vote? Get the hell out of it as soon as I could. You would come out. Why, why, why would you come out? I this don't... is a more significant... Uh, endorsement of the out campaign than Ian Botham, I think. <laughs> Not really. I don't see what Europe d does for England. You don't see any economic benefit? None at all. The, the big Anything market? Anything we've got that we want to sell, people will buy. If people have got something, we've got the money... We'll but you it. don't think if, you know, we say we're not going to join their club, that they might take umbrage at that... And do what? And cause problems for us. Like freaks. Well, all our imports, and I, I'm meant to be interviewing you, by the way. All our... <laughs> <laughs> this is my technique. Uh, all our imports and exports basically yeah. go there. Well, the big investors come from there. We make the big investments. Our financial services... In, I mean, if I look at it from WPP's point of view, we would lose influence in four of our top ten markets, Germany, France, Italy and Spain. Brussels, whether we like it or not, is important. It's important that we have you know, contact and people on the ground. You don't see any benefit of that. I don't know. Do you, are you absolutely sure you would lose? Yes, absolutely positive. I, I know clients will close plants. I know that jobs will go. Now, the question is, how long is that going to Gonna, gonna happen for, but you, you, so the economy, economic. What about the sovereignty thing? You, you worry about surrendering power to these bureaucrats in Brussels? I don't think we need to have anything to do with the bureaucrats in Brussels. Okay. And what about immigration? You worry about immigration? You think immigrants yeah, have made a contribution? Absolutely. That you think they made a contribution or not? They haven't. They have not. So you agree with Norman Lamont, who said it's a net, net uh, negative to the British economy. I'm an immigrant. Second generation. You think it would be better if I was... My, pe my grandparents had been Personally, refused entry. Yeah. That, it, that you should go? Yeah. <laughs> no, but what about my, grand my poor grandparents who came yeah. from Russia in 1899? Yeah. Yeah. So it was 31 years before you were born. Um, and they couldn't speak a word of English. You know, they signed their wedding certificate with a cross. The four witnesses also a cross. They, used to live in, they lived in the East End. And they wouldn't, if there'd been a point system or, you know, if you'd had your way on in relation to immigration, they wouldn't have come in. You think, you think that's right? Immigrants don't make a contribution. <coughs> I don't know. You probably have thought about it. Do you think the world's changed since then? Well, actually, interestingly, the pogroms in Russia, and, you know, we may touch on Hitler at some point in time in the five hours that we've been assigned... Um, and what happened in Nazi Germany is not dissimilar to some of the things that we're seeing in Syria. And, and so, you know, I, at one level, I think we have an obligation. I don't want to sound too high-minded about it, but I think we have an obligation to... And, and I think the contribution that those immigrants made from Russia, from Germany, uh, from Poland, from Romania, from Hungary, from Czech, Czechoslovakia, as it then was, yeah, made a big contribution to this, this, this country. But basically, Bernie is an outer. 100%. OK. And why do you think these people want to come here? Um, well, some of them because they, they're oppressed for religious reasons, political reasons, for social reasons. Uh, they are hard-working, well-educated, can make a contribution to the economy. There are some that may not be of that ilk, but basically... There's a, a, an intelligence, an ability, a training, uh, a, a motivation. Motivation is an extremely important part of it uh, that I think is very important. So, I, you know, you, you, you like Norman Lamont at an event that I was at where I was arguing in and he was arguing out. I asked him the same question. He, his answer was the same as yours. I, and I'm emotional about it because uh, of my grandparents, but I, I tune out on that. So we haven't got this off to a great start. <laughs> so let me, let me just... Well, this we is... got the start that I haven't answered the question. No, you said you is... weren't going to vote. No, but you, you said... said to me, would I, should you go? 
Hmm. So I, do I you think I, think I should go? I didn't answer. Okay, you'll be ambivalent <laughs> about that. All right, so let's leave it. So this is in a series of interviews that we started with Dave Brailsford, who's a winner, and then Ben Ainsley last year we did in the, the church, which was a wonderful venue, another winner. You're another winner. You've um, created an incredible business um, out of Formula One. And uh, the one, one thing that you may not know, you, put, you pretty much know everything, but uh, just in case you don't know, is that Dartford plays a, a, a role. It plays a, yeah. a role in my life too, because Wire and Plastic Products had a wireworks in Dartford, and that's where our little quest 31 years ago with, uh, with uh, Wire and Plastic Products started, when I went and saw Gordon really? Sampson, who was managing director of the, wire, uh, the wireworks in Dartford and Kent. So our... Our, our paths have crossed. Do you want to say a little bit about your background? Just, you know, son of a trawlerman? Uh, yes, my dad used to be a captain of a, a trawler. You were born in 1930, before, yeah. before the Second World War. And education? You were a physicist, weren't you? No. I, 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 Later in on in, in your life. official biography, it says Later you're a physicist. On. OK, at Woolwich. I mean, I was unfortunate enough to be born in a very small little village where I think... In Suffolk? Six people in the class. Village school? Yeah. So I wouldn't say my education was good. You left school at 16, yeah? Uh, yeah. And what did you do when you leave sc left school at 16? Um, I went to work for somebody that had a business selling... Motorcycles, right? And what do you what do you remember? What about your mum and your dad? What do you remember about them? And then my, my dad was f highly formative in my life. So was my mother, but my father more than my mother actually. Did you have a close relationship with dad? Yeah, yeah. And what was he like? Well, very supportive and uh, probably I would say he's quite cautious mm -hmm. in the way he sort of thought about things. What was his advice to you about what you should do? I don't know what it was, and I'm sure I didn't listen to it. <laughs> and what about your mother? Same. Same? Any brothers or sisters? One sister. Still here with no. us? No. And what, what did she do? Uh, she got married. Yeah. And then become deceased. Were you close, close to her? Not really. No? Not, no. So it was very much you on your own? Yeah. OK. And then you went into motorcycles, and then what happened? How did you, how did you get hooked into Formula One? You were, you were heavily involved in, in motor racing. Well, I bought out the guy that I used to work for. In, so, so you went into the business? I went in with another partner with, a, with somebody, then bought out the other people. Yeah. So then we made a few dollars, yeah. and I started racing. Right, this is, was this like Formula, Formula One? Motorbikes. Motorbikes, yeah. And, and then you... Then into Formula 3, then... In, t Formula 3, from 2 and 1. So when I was... And what, when was... How old were you when you started to get involved in Formula 1? What, what year was it, roughly? When I... 1962 or something? 70. 70? OK, so, so when I joined Mark McCormack and we started to represent Jackie Stewart and met people like John Coombs, yeah. Teddy Mayer yeah. and all those people... Uh, you know, Jochen Rint and all, all those people. You you were running, was it Brabham at that Brabham, time? Yeah. yeah, at that time. And very I successful. Brabham and was right. Brabham. Yeah. yeah, and so you, you went from motorcycles to Formula One? No. Went into, I was racing Formula Three and all yeah. different series. And how were you as a racing driver? Are you a good driver? Well, they were one of a few things. Come on, don't be modest. Come on. No, that's the truth. Yeah, no, but you, but you won a few things. Yeah, but I mean, what happened? I had an accident. And was laying in the bed in the hospital, and I thought... You ended up in the car park or something, didn't you, when you were driving? <laughs> I thought, you know, this isn't the sort of way to, to really be, because I was running a good business as well at the time. Right. So I decided to stop. And because of the safety aspect, or the lack Sa of safety? My safety. Your safety aspect. My safety, right. yes. Okay. And that was Formula 3, and then you ran Brabham. You won how many world championships with Brabham? Two. Two. Three. Three. three, three. And the driver there was Jack, or what? The driver, we had a few drivers. Okay. Jochen was... Jochen was one of them? Jochen drove for me in Formula 2. OK, and did Jim, Jim Clark two. drive for you or not? No, we had Graham Hill, a lot of the guys that... Right, you know, top right, 
Okay. And so then how did you get involved on the, the F1 side of it? I mean, how did you initially... Because if you look at the history, you offered people like Colin Chapman, Teddy Mayer and others the opportunity to participate with you in putting Formula yeah. One together. Yeah. No, I, I went to one of the, uh, we used to have these silly meetings, and at that time they said, would I look after things, for financial things, and do deals with promoters, which I agreed to do. Right. And got a percentage for doing that. Then it sort of grew from there. And I said, well, why don't we all put some money in, and I'll run everything. Right. And they said no. No, they said we want to race, so you get on and run the business and do what you like. So and, it went and, we, from there. and when was that? It was sort of middle seventies, early seventies. Probably late. Right. And you started to pull together the circuit from then. How many races were going on today? Well, I think it's the most races. important thing we did was to control the television. Right. Because TV companies used to televise what they wanted to televise and show what they wanted mm. to show. So I got them together to make sure they broadcast every race mm -hmm. and originated every race as well. Mm -hmm. And how, ma how many races were there at that time? 16. 16, but mainly in Europe? Yeah. I mean, there was virtually not... There was stuff in Latin America. Yeah, but yeah. Argentina, Argentina and, Brazil. Mexi and Brazil, Brazil, not Mexico. And Mexico, yeah. and Mexico yeah. right. And there was, there was not very little, if anything. Japan, was there at that time? No. No. So there was very little in Asia. Yep. Certainly nothing in China or that or that na nature yeah. or India or anything like that. And then the rest was Europe, Western Europe. Exactly. Not, not Eastern Europe. No, Western. Western Europe. And maybe your your dislike of Europe is is or, or, or the common market or the EU is partly driven by the fact that over the years they've become less important from a Formula One point of view. No, I think. Europe has become less important, full stop. And you mean Western Europe, Eastern Europe or both? Because you're a great admirer of Vladimir Putin and, and, and what he's done in Russia, aren't you? He should be running Europe. He should be in Brussels running Europe? No, we should get rid of Brussels and he should just be in charge. And in charge of us too? Yes, of course. If we want to be in that... So, so he should run in the 2020 election here in the UK? Vladimir. Why do you admire him so much? Yeah, he does what he says he's going to do and gets the job done. He gets the job done. Do you think we mishandled, going off a little bit of a tangent here, but here we go, do you think we, I, I, I think, just to preface it, that we badly mishandled our relationships with him prior to the Ukrainian pr uh, uprising problem, prior to Sochi, I mean, the fact that no Western leader turned up at the Sochi Olympic opening ce yeah. ceremony, I think, was a terrible mistake. Absolutely. Do you agree with that? Sure. Why do you think that? Because it was his personal project, Putin's no, personal I mean, I th people don't understand exactly what he wants to do. What does he want to do? He wants to... He, first, he wants to put Russia back to what it was. Mm -hmm. and it's basically the most important thing for him. Mm -hmm. And And... Just to clarify for a minute, because you know s some people may be operating under a misunderstanding or misapprehension. You, you, you were quoted, I think, in the, London, the Times, as being an admirer of Adolf Hitler, and, and that that's not true, is it? Really, not true at all. Right, but you did say something about. But prior to 1938, he was. No, I he, said my he gets things done as well. He got the job done. Okay. I tell you how it all started. I was yeah. being interviewed, and a lady she was saying about it this type of thing. And I said how I admired Mrs. Thatcher. Right. And then how did you get from Mrs. Thatcher to Adolf Hitler? And she said... <laughs> well, they wasn't close. <laughs> um, I said exactly the same as a lot of other people. For example. Yeah. And then the example came out. And you, and, and you would apply the same thing to Saddam Hussein as well, wouldn't you? Think, you think it... Some people would agree with you that it... I think if we had him in power still, we wouldn't have the problems we got. Uh, I think a lot. Some there are some people who would agree with that. I think more people than than we probably would would or they would they would admit that. So come back to to Formula One for a minute. What was the seminal moment? You said TV, mm. and of course TV has changed now. We'll come on to that in a few minutes. But what was the seminal moment 
uh, who was running the FIA? Uh, the FIA being created at that time? That you oh, yeah. Been, yeah. No, it's been going a long time. And the FIA, who ran the FIA? Was that Max Mosley then? No, no, no. This was before Max. Right. Long before Max. And so, and, and you had a good relationship with the people yeah. who ran the FIA. And what was yeah. the role of the FIA vis-a-vis -vis F1 at that time? Is it different to today or not? It was sort of um, just more or less it's sort of a gentleman's organisation. Hmm. The FIA was? Yeah. And, and who, who ran it? That, do you remember who ran it at that time? It was before Ballet's time. Yeah. I think before his time. And, and then, so they were the regulator. Mm. You put all the circuit together, about 16 races uh, on a regular basis. You had TV. And how did the, the I mean, the, the, the seminal moment, as I look at the history and Tom Bauer's book, which was, a, I think, a good book, uh, on on you, and I think um, you know it was a balanced book. I think, uh, but the agreement that you struck with the FI, the hundred year agreement. Mm. Do you want to just describe? I a mean, little bit really, because that was really important. Wasn't these it? things all started because we had a little bit of a disagreement with the manufacturers mm -hmm. at that time, and that's it. Sort of, sort of split with the FIA siding with the manufacturers mm -hmm. and the English teams, it was all Who the were the English dominant team. manufacturers? Ferrari was still was there? They were, but they wasn't really the people making the problems so much. Who were the people who were making the problems? Well, Alfa Romeo at that time. Which was were, were heavily in and they were yeah, causing trouble. Yeah. And they were independent or part of Fiat at that time? Independent. Independent. And they were giving you aggravation? Not really. I mean, they had an opinion which yeah. we didn't happen to agree with. <laughs> They were giving you aggravation. On what? What were they? They wanted to write the rules and run everything. Mm. We're, actually, we're getting close back to those days again. So engines, yeah. format. Yeah, general. Generally. They wanted, it was about control. So we had a bit of a, a standoff, and we then made an agreement with the FIA. Right, which was a 100-year agreement. No, no, oh. not at all. This is when this Concord Agreement became about, which right. was a peace treaty. Right, but with, between the manufacturers, between the, the teams, teams, and and F1, and it was a, and and that, and what about the the rights agreement with the FIA? This was after that, right? That um, the FIA wanted to get rid of the commercial side of things. So again, just like so the, the manufacturers have said to you, you look after the yeah. the race. The FIA said you look after no. They put up for sale the commercial rights. So you bid against them, something else? No, we made an offer. They were offered more than we bought it for. And then the people that made the offer, actually it was Ferrari people. Ferrari made the offer? Well, it's head in it up. Decided they didn't quite want to give what they said they would give. Right. So we bought. So, and and do, you, do you remember how much you paid for it? I think 380 million, something like that. Over a period of time, wasn't it? It wasn't all down. Two days or three days. <laughs> it wasn't 380 over a we long... We paid it. OK, very yeah. interesting. And that was a 100-year agreement which yeah. gave you the... And that's, that's now been running for how many years? 12 years, I think. OK, so, so there's still 88 to go? Okay. I'm going to try and see it out, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing you, I think you will. You'll probably be able to... But, uh, 170 odd, but uh, uh, knowing you, you will. And that was the that was really the crucial agreement, wasn't it? Well, yes. It, I mean, it's never worked the way it should. Right. Because when you've got something like all the federations, they're all there for different reasons to what the people that participate are for. Mm. So there's always problems. Okay. So just that. 100-year agreement, you know, locked in F1 with the FIA and the manufacturers. And, of course, there's a series of Concord agreements. <coughs> you, yeah. you renewed several... How many Concord yeah. agreements have that been? Three or four, I think. Right. But the, the balance in the Concord agreement has shifted over time, hasn't it? I mean, in the, in the initial days, the splits... The amount of money was split in a different yeah, way. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, it, was sure. split. it was much more in the favour of F1... Than it, yes, than it is today. Absolutely. So the balance of power, in a way, has shifted to the manufacturers over the time. Teams. To the teams. Sorry, the to the, I'm yeah. not manufacturers, the teams. Yeah. Is that true? 
um, financially is. And do you think it's gone too far? I think maybe the way we've sort of split up the money seemed a good idea at the time. Subsequently, I think if we could, I'd be very happy to tear up all our agreements with all the teams. And start again. Because the teams now, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just grounds of disclosure, I'm on the board of F1. Yep. And uh, as a non-executive director, I've been for quite a long period of time. Bernie runs uh, F1 uh, as the CEO. And, uh, you know, we've seen, we've seen what's happened uh, over that period of time. But you've, you've now got the, the lead manufacturers have been Ferrari. They've been McLaren. Uh, now Red Bull and Mercedes. And, and of course, Correct. you've given Mercedes, uh, or we've given, let's put it like that, um, a prominent position. You've now got four big... There are four big manufacturers who split, who split the, the money. It's more in favour of them than Absolutely. it is the smaller teams. Absolutely. Is that a problem? Yeah. You think There's it should be more equalised? No, it's a problem for the smaller teams because it's... If you talk about things being competitive or anti-competitive... Right. You've got these teams at the... I suppose the worst... The lowest team are going to receive this year something like... 60 million, mm -hmm. yeah, and the top teams close to 200. Mm -hmm. So you can understand how difficult it is for these teams to come from where they are mm -hmm. to where they should be. Mm -hmm. So it should be balanced out yeah. more between them. Otherwise, it'll be just be dominated. Well, it's dominated by Mercedes now anyway, isn't it? Yeah, but you voted for this. <laughs> it's my fault. It's not your fault. It's my fault. Right, <laughs> OK. No, no, we're, we're, we, we, we all... When you it say was we for voted a particular it, reason. We did, we did approve the elevation to the peerage, or whatever we call it, of, of Mercedes-Benz to be sort of oh, equal, right. equal. Because you never thought they were going to run, win no, two, that was two consecutive No, that was my mistake. Yeah. So it wasn't Admit all me. To that. It Nothing was you to do with you. It was my mistake. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I know you listened to me. Yes, I did. I yes. thought I knew what I was doing. I always listen to and you it, and look what a mess it's got. It exactly into. right. You yes, yes. Happened. That's right. So, so that was... You think that should be right. now? Just so we're we're clear about this, this is a company that has revenues. I think this is public information. I hope it is anyway. About 1.7 billion dollars, um, and EBITDA around half a billion dollars. So so 380 million dollars, whatever the price was for no, that. No, this year the teams will receive nearly a billion. Yeah, but the the EBITDA after the after the teams, and that's the the point is the teams are receiving a billion dollars. In the old days, at the first time Concord agreements, it would probably be the reverse way around, wouldn't it? Oh, a lot less. Yes, yeah. I mean, I mean, you, it would be F1 that would be getting the billion, yeah. and and the, the the teams would be getting say half or something like something like that. So it's a total change. Okay. So I think that's a, a lot of the history. Just a matter of interest. Who's going to win the world championship this year, Jim? Hamilton. Hamilton will come, even though he's lost the first three so, races. Yeah. You think he he will? What do you think of him as a driver? Well, he's extremely talented. As a driver? As a driver. He's a charming guy. He's the best thing that happened to Formula One for a long time. Right. It gets but you've been there. critical of him, haven't you? Never. I thought you... I thought I read... Oh, I, might, I shouldn't read what I believe in the media. Silly, silly me. No, I, I, think, um, but I think he's been great for Formula One. He's great for Formula One. And is it the right sort of personality, celebrity for Formula One? Yeah, why not? Well, if you go back, you mentioned Joachim, Rin, yep. who I knew when I was yes. bag carrying yeah. for Jackie Stewart. Um, when you go back, in, who, who's the greatest driver that there's ever been? Well, you know, people always ask that, and it's difficult to answer because it depends where they are, which car they're in. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sterling Moss should have, probably at that time, by far the best driver, mm -hmm. but always picked the wrong team to be in. Mm -hmm. So. Was that because he made the wrong decisions or somebody advised him? Well, he him? wanted to win the World Championship for England. Mm -hmm. So sometimes... It, but, you know, one or two of the other guys, that like Fangio and people like that, they chose you know what Fangio? car they wanted. You knew Fangio, yeah. They knew what car they wanted to be in. And therefore they benefited as a result. Because yeah. there was a recent survey done, a sort of some sort of modelling company. I think they ranked Fangio as the, the, the most... Successful driver, or maybe it was PK. I don't, I don't know. I can't remember who it was. Yeah. Or 
Who do you think the best driver there's ever been? You think it would be? You mentioned Sterling Moss. Who? who? Sterling. I mean, lots of guys. As I say today, if you said to me today, who's the best? It depends. A lot of guys are at the back of the field, <clears throat> and if they were driving one of the cars that's at the front, they'd be up the front. You haven't mentioned Jackie Stewart. What do you think of him? Jackie, good. Obviously, was very good. Yeah. No, I mean, Jackie, when I worked for him. Uh, he was he was in the forefront on safety. You mentioned you know yeah, you ended absolutely. up in the car park and you yeah. worried about. It. I mean he was in the forefront of, of protective, yeah. uh, flame proof, yeah. flame resistant uniforms, yeah. safety on the track. Yeah, and so you think he was sort of similar. What about Jim Clark? Jim was a different sort of a guy, super 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 driver. Yeah, and uh, he wasn't all that about safety. And he wouldn't have saved his life if he had it been. It was like Mike Hawthorne and those and Mike. people. Yeah, Same. very frankly, the, the white these scarf. Guys were, the these yeah. were racers. They, weren't, they, they took the risk. They were racers, yeah. Mm. OK, all right. So um, come back now to TV, because TV, and we've got assembled here the cream of the advertising industry in the UK and beyond. So you have a... Remarkable. This is the way I sold Bernie on the idea that this was a good idea. Um, that you have the cream of the industry. Um, the F1 brand um, has taken some hits recently. I mean, it's, it's, how would you describe the health of the F1 Formula One at the moment? I mean, you've said you wouldn't buy a ticket to watch Absolutely. a race. Absolutely. Why is that? <clears throat> because I think people. Any sporting event that people go to, you don't want to th more or less know who's going to win. What the result is. Yeah. You want to go, you and I going along with some other people, and we'd have an argument, maybe in the car, saying, I think he's going to win. You say, you must be mad. Yeah. And now you don't. You say, Lewis is going to be on pole, he's going to win the race, and Nico is going to be second. Mm. It's not what people want. Right, so you want a more competitive. So it comes Absolutely. back to the balance between the teams. Yeah. Um, and so you would like to see a different system to achieve that. But do you think it's the best way to get change is for you to say that you wouldn't buy a ticket? I mean, if the CEO of F1 says, and the leader of F1, mm. I mean, so we're all clear about it, you own directly or indirectly through your, the trust of about, what, 15% of Formula One? Yeah, the, sh the trust own, yeah, no, not me. Yeah, OK, they own, okay. what, 12%? And CVC owned 35, but they have voting control, and the rest mm. is with an amalgam of institutions. It's, it's, in the end, it's nothing to do with any of those people. Mm. And and you don't control it from a technical point of view, but you you know from a legal point of view. But you are the representative of F1, and for the representative of F1, you are the. I mean, I get a, a feed every day um, of. The stuff that you say that comes out of a F1, it is incredible. I mean, the, the media attention on F1 actually absolutely outpaces our industry to a very enormous factor. It's incredible. Everybody hangs on every word you say in relation to, to F1 racing and things beyond that. You know, F1 in political figures and Brexit, and we'll, we'll come on to Donald Trump in a minute. But, but do you think it's right for you? to take that position. You know, Gerald Ratner said, you know, lost his job because he said you know, the jewellery he sold was crap. Do you think, which I think you've said, not something dissimilar about the races, do you think that's the right way to present it? <coughs> I never used that word, but uh, in the end, whatever I said, I meant that. Yeah. Um, I thought maybe it would wake one or two people up because I think there are people that's involved in the business that need a wake-up call. Those people being... Well, Mercedes in particular. Mm -hmm. And they need a wake-up call because it's not in their interest to be Well, so I don't dominant. think it's in their interest for everybody to know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. People have said this to me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and that's the reason why television, for example, is more difficult to sell television yeah. rights than well, before? I mean, it's in general. Mm -hmm. In general, that's the problem. OK. I mean, we are putting on, or have been, sorry, putting on a lousy show. Mm -hmm. 
Do you think you... Pr so, there's lots of potential sponsors here. I mean, one uh, company client of ours, uh, the, the chairman and CEO, uh, so more likely to be an American-based company, it wasn't an American-based company, said to me that he'd like to invest in F1, but he wasn't going to because of the controversies mm. surrounding the, right. the sport. You, you agree with that? Yeah, 100%. What arguments would you make to him? I mean, he's a big, he runs a big, big consumer company, um, packaged goods company. What arguments would you put to him that he should invest in sponsorship, either at the F1 level? So let's be quite clear, there are sort of master F1, so these are like top sponsors of the yep. Olympics, and then there are people who sponsor the teams, right? But Correct. Either at the top level, so something like Rolex does with you, uh, or at a team level. So what's the arguments that you, you, you would make? I think we need to, and we are, if you realise now that Ferrari have woken up mm -hmm. and they're competitive. In fact, they should have won the last two races. Why didn't they? I think they may wonder. They were unlucky in some cases and made a mistake in others. Right. So, but for sure, 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 they should be, and they will be winning races. Mm -hmm. uh, Red Bull again were very, very competitive in the last race, mm -hmm. but whether that's going to continue, I don't know. I mean, the big it was a very simple solution to everything. That the Mercedes should have allowed Red Bull to use their engine. Mm -hmm. I refuse to say it should have made it available as a common engine. Yeah, and well, they should. They other people used it. Right. And they were quite, they were right in what they said. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wolf came out quite clearly and said, basically, over my dead body, they're our competitors mm -hmm. and we're not going to make sure they beat us. Mm -hmm. And I think Ferrari, Sergio said that as well. Okay. Why should we supply our competitor with the same sort of engine Engine's. as us? Right. So, the so they're probably right. Probably you and I would have done exactly the same thing. Yes. I mean, if we were running yeah. Mercedes, we would want we would do exactly an advantage, a competitive Absolutely. advantage for Mercedes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's not good for Formula One. Okay. You described the, win the, 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 the drivers as being windbags recently. No, I never used that expression. I keep on seeing these words that are yeah, attributed to you that well, never. The, you know I know the feeling, actually, the same thing happens, yeah. uh, but on a much smaller scale. But, but you know exactly. What, what are you trying to get at? What was that? <coughs> they should do what they're paid to do is to drive the car. And that's it. But they are ambassadors for the sport as well, because anybody in this yeah, room that wants to sponsor it, they're course. going to be sponsoring the no, team, the F1, they're going to sponsor the drivers. They the were, one or two of them, explaining how they thought Formula 1 should be run. Right. We don't need their opinion, because we know. Are you referring to the starting grid formula? Well, or? F yeah, the reason, why we did try to change that? It wasn't my idea for a start. Right. But... Um, I wanted to change it a different way. It was very simple to make sure we didn't see the quickest cars first and second on the grid. Right. Better they start and have to come through the. And grid. this was the results of double points for the last race as well to make, also make that a little bit the more. The last race, yes, to make it a bit of interest. To make it a bit more interest. Okay. All right, so uh, I want to open it up to, and I think we got, may have um, microphones or, or whatever. Yes, we've got microphones, so I want to open it up. We've been going for about half an hour, so I don't want to keep Bernie for the five hours, so um, we'll have a, another half an hour and please chime in with some questions. But a, a couple of things. Uh, on the future of uh, F1, it was being built on television, as you yeah. handedly said. Television's changing. Linear TV, network television, you know, we can debate it, and I'm sure Matt's had lots of sessions here about the role of linear TV, there's the growth of uh, social media, of new media, which we're all well aware of. There was a session here on Snapchat a few minutes ago. Well, you, you, you banned Lewis Hamilton from using No, I so. didn't. You didn't. Mercedes did. Mercedes did. Okay, it was Mercedes. I did together. the opposite. I tried you to didn't. help him. I tried to help him. So, so this was... Why did, why did Mercedes ban him using Snapchat? No idea. Okay. Because he was using... Was he we using made a camera crew available for him to follow him. Okay, in the pits and everything, and in the car, and they objected to that. Was it because it, was it a rights issue, or was it? That's like an NFL. You can't take. They never had any rights. Okay. About broadcasting. Okay, so so it was really was sort of logistics, was it, or what? I don't know. They just 
didn't want him to do this. OK, so the question is, you know, with the growth of new media and uh, network TV and Sky, I think, do a fantastic job. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant job. I mean, they made a really super, quantum super, leap, super. much better than the BBC. Yeah. Yeah. And they really know how to use it from a, from a new media point of view and et cetera. Come back to new media for a minute. How are you going to change the model as regards broadcasting? Are you going to increasingly use these new social media, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Apple? Can you say a little bit about how you see it? Because you're not a great fan. You, you, you tried an <clears throat> Apple iPhone, didn't you? Well, I never, I couldn't understand it. And the people said to me, ah, yes, but the young kids are doing this. And I said, well, the young kids don't buy the articles that our sponsors sell. So it doesn't help us a lot. But that doesn't help us with this group out here. We, we want to, Why? To, to, to pour investment into the sport because they are interested in capturing the hearts and minds of those young people as well. I mean, those, those young people are going to be, irrespective of what May their I position is. Go ahead. That's what I thought. Yeah. I've been educated. And I realised how important it is. OK. I so couldn't see at the time how what I was told could possibly help Formula One. So this is the conversion. You're now, and you're now of the view that all these new media, or some of them, can be of help. I mean, yeah, absolutely. We support it wherever we can. Right. And so which do you see as the most uh, attractive? I mean, I, it would be wonderful for you to, to be on Twitter. It would be fantastic, I think, for you to be on Twitter because, you know, you would, you would instantly respond and it would be really interesting to see what you said. All sorts of things. You don't tweet? No, not at all. Can't we get you to do that? No. OK, all right. Do you have a Facebook page? No. Which phone do you use? I've then? just learned to use the telephone. The, 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 the old telephone or the new telephone? A new, I've got a new one. Which one have you got? Which brand have you got? Wait a minute. I'm not in the advertising business. You are. This one. OK. It looks like a, an Apple phone to me. Yeah. Yes, it's a, an iPhone. OK. And are you using that now extensively? Do you have an iPad? No. A PC? No. No? OK. All right. So this is, this is, this is how you state That's that. it. OK. So we can expect to see a much more aggressive approach on, on new media by F1. I'm supporting a lot of our staff that are dealing with this. OK. To make sure that we do use it. OK. Um, so one other question on geography. Uh, we, Europe has become less important. Do you think there has to be a British Grand Prix? Well, I was told there wouldn't be Formula One without the French Grand Prix. Still going. Right. No French Grand Prix. Right. And German Grand Prix necessary? I mean, I wish we had a French Grand Prix and, and I hope we can continue. And why with don't German you have a French Grand Prix? Grand Prix? Is it people just not willing to ante up the That's necessary? Exactly right. How much does it cost to put on a race? Depends how they do it. I mean, but uh, you've got to reckon. An event will cost somebody $60 million. $60 million. And to build a track from scratch, a purpose-built track, $200 million? Plus a bit. Plus a bit. So any country that wants to go into... Uh, and any country that's thinking about positioning itself or city or whatever around a sporting event has the choice of Olympics, World Cup or F1. That's, that's it, yep. isn't it? So F1 is incredibly important, actually, in terms of brand positioning for countries or cities or yeah. even, even regions. So anybody, government, that wants to build track would have to pay something... Depends. I mean, now we're encouraging a lot more street races. Yeah. Which are uh, cheaper. <sighs> Singapore really. Is, is, is really yeah. good, huh? Yeah, this, uh, most of the street races are. Yeah. OK. Uh, and so, do you see the growth coming from, in the future, more and more Asia? It's very much like our business, I think. Asia, Latin Absolutely. America, Africa in the Middle East and Central East Europe. Correct. Where would you like to have races that you don't have? Africa. Right. Where? South Africa. South Africa. We, we had, when I was with Jackie, with Kyle Army. We, we, used, to, we, used, we, used, to, we used to go down to Kyle Army. But they're Kyle rebuilding Army. Kyle Army, so we'll have a look at it again. And how many races would you have in America? You're going to have one in Las Vegas. We're looking at it. I mean, really and truly, we need at least six. 
You have Austin. It's six in the States alone. You have Austin. New Jersey is going to happen or not? I Unlikely. Doubt. Unlikely. Um, Las Vegas, probability? Which way? I mean, Las Vegas would be ideal. Yeah, yeah. We'll... And that would be a road race? A street race? Yeah, street race, yeah. Yeah, so relatively easy. It's all to getting put together for that. So those would be three if they if we manage to get New Jersey as well, and you think another three yeah. is a possibility. What's the maximum you could run? It's twenty one at the minute. Uh, I suppose in the end we could have twenty five races. Is there a restrict? The Concord is restricted. Twenty two is it? No, it's not really. No, it's not really. So, so the the problem what restricts it is the teams. Right. Because you know. At the moment, they're all the staff's all on the limit. Okay, so you have right. to be careful. So we open it up. Can we open, find out anybody has questions? One over there. Good, this gentleman here. To us, we're waiting for the microphone. What do you think of Donald Trump? Because you tried to negotiate a race with Trump in America, didn't yeah, you? A long time ago, yeah. And what happened? It didn't. <laughs> Why? I don't know. You know, things. I don't know. Do you think he'd be a good president? I think he'd be fantastic. Why? <laughs> because he, I, I'm sure he's much more flexible than most of them. I think he's the sort of guy, if he's done something and made a mistake, he'll say, seemed a good idea at the time. And so you think he's flexible, and do you think he's a good negotiator? He, I, for his, he used to be for himself. Yeah. And so I suppose it would be. Now, you know Vladimir Putin well. You know Trump. How do you think they're going to get on? Good. They would get on very They're Absolutely. meeting their minds. Absolutely. We shouldn't be worried if Donald Trump no. had his finger on the nuclear button. No problem at all. Uh, Mr. Putin would tell him what to do, and he would undoubtedly do it, and that would be it. So, so he'd become Putin's poodle? No, but... he'd okay. understand quickly. OK. All right, so, over here, first. Um, how would you like to see... From... Could you just say who you are and where you're from? Uh, my name's Jonathan Haig. I'm from Velvet PR. The question I have is, how would you like to see Formula One improve its gender diversity over the next four or five years? Gender diversity, how would you improve? So, women drivers? Uh, women drivers, women heads of teams, uh, obviously, uh, Williams are in a good position, but just improving gender diversity, obviously, a lot of the summit's been around that this week. So, how would we get more women into the sport? Well, I mean, it's, I've always felt bad about this because I don't know whether a woman is be able physically to drive a Formula One car quickly. Um, and even if they could, they're never going to be taken seriously. This is, this is what the big problem is. And Clang. it's completely wrong. Yeah. <laughs> they won't be taken seriously, because people won't believe it. But, Somebody, a woman's got to prove. But, it, but Bernie, is it, is it you thinking that, or do you think generally people? Because I don't think peop people and you've indicated in this session that you're willing to change your Absolutely. mind. Right? So, like on new media, you change your mind. I would urge you to think again on that, because... I've thought it, about it. Now I've changed my mind. I think you think again. No, no, no. I, today, I would love and I would help for, to get a lady in a Formula One car. Well, so, so let's say a sponsor came along and said, I mean, let's say... Uh, the gentleman asked that question, came yeah. along and said, you know, we're willing to put... To, co to run a Formula One team is about 100 million a year, cost you? Maybe a bit more, actually, but... OK, but let's say 100, yeah, we'll purpose of this discussion. Do to get on with. Well, we'll put in 100 million, we'll sponsor a team, but it's going to be an all-female team, what would you say? Great. You would, you would take the money? No, i tell you what I'd do, I'd put another 20 million in to make sure it happened. Yeah, so, there's a challenge, right? So, if we can, as an industry, Cobble together a hundred million. Bernie will put twenty, another twenty, and so we'll, we'll then we'll be solvent. Should be, yeah, right. should be better on it, probably. Okay, fine. All right. So, okay. So, now what about team management? I mean, you don't have to be, if you're right, which I disagree with, because I think women do a lot of physical jobs and sports as effectively as men. But you know, let's talk about team management. Some of our well, not some of our. I, I've said publicly women in our business do a better job than men often. And certainly in some of the things that we do, 
they're much more effective. I'm surprised. And what about team management? I'm surprised that quite a long time ago, maybe this was five or six years ago, if you like, I said within 10 years, I think that 50% of companies' CEO will be women. Mm -hmm. Well, we will hope because that's the case because it's because not the case. Because they're more competent. Ah. And they don't ah. have massive egos. Progress. Right, so you, you heard that first. No, no, it? reality. No, no, it's, it's true. And, and of purchase decisions, I can't remember, is it 75% or 70% or 80%? Of purchase decisions are made by women, so logically it shouldn't just be 50 on the basis of population or distribution of intelligence. It should be, it should be because they make the purchase decisions. Who's next? Don't be shy. Over there on the left. Hello, Hi. Mongo from uh, PrimeSight. Um, the, the UK has uh, traditionally been a very strong base for uh, manufacturers and for uh, the teams, really. Uh, do you think that strong base in the UK is at all under threat, um, either with or without Brexit, or are there any other influences that might stop us being um, as, as interested and as, as good at producing Formula One teams as we seem to be? Well, out of all the, let me ask you the questions now. Out of all the teams that are co competing in Formula One, how many teams are, operate outside of the UK? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Is how many? He said he doesn't know the answer to that. A couple. I mean, the reason it operates well in the UK because everybody steals everybody else's staff. So you've got a cottage industry that works very well. And well, so they steal from one another? Yeah. Ideas and people. If yeah, because then people... So it's a bit like the advertising industry, is it? I don't know what happens. Yeah, well, what, what happens in the industry is, you know, you win a piece of business, you steal them from other agencies, uh, which is one of the problems we have in the industry. We, we have not been very good at training people and keeping people over long periods of time. It's one of the instabilities in the industry. I mean, everybody, the, the trade press lives on this, and, you know, rumors about who's going where and what and accounts and whatever. So it's not dissimilar in that. Your description of it as a cottage yeah. industry, historically, certainly that was the case. And that, that's the, that's it. So this is the home and will remain that. Yeah. Home. I mean, Mercedes have nothing to do with Germany, with the Formula One team. Yeah. There's just one thing on that. Whitmarsh has gone from Formula One to working with, with uh, Ben Ainsley. Do you, th do you just think intuitively that, that we'll win the America's Cup, that Keith Mills' team will win the America's Cup because they've got Whitmarsh doing the design? I wouldn't put my money on it. You would it. not? Yes, would not. And why do you say that? Because Keith says that the challenges of America's Cup sailing, because they're not sailboats anymore as I remember them, or as you remember them, or as your dad would remember them as a trawl woman. But, you know, they're sort of like, they're, um, they go above the waves, yeah. and they sort of scoot above the waves. I think, it, basically, it's the same with Formula One. It's a case of how much they're prepared to spend. You think the and money... I think that team will spend what it takes. You, the, the America's Cup team? You think the Americans will, will be, will invest more? So you think it's purely a matter of money? Yeah. Not... Get in the right people. Well, isn't Whitmarsh the right person? I don't know. I mean, he, he hasn't uh, done anything at the moment, obviously. I mean, there's people out there that have won. Right. So you've got well, they've to had a, they've, had a they've, they've in the preliminary races they've done okay. We'll we'll see how they, they yeah. get going. Okay. I hope so. Okay. So UK is the is the core. Who else? Yes, down here. Can we get? You can bellow if you if you. Hi, uh, Daryl from Fremantle. Be careful what you say because you're handy. Yes, <laughs> I'll be nice. Uh, Daryl from Fremantle Media. I was just asking in terms of like um, with the engine, so like moving forward, maybe far into the future with like kind of economics and electric cars, hybrids. Like, do you see Formula One ever being full electric or what do you see as moving forward where it would go or is it always going to be um, petrol powered and turbocharged? Hey. I don't think any car, the, the world won't be all electric with cars, for sure. And at the moment, this power unit that we have is an incredible piece of engineering. It really is. 
I've said for a long, long time, it isn't what we need in Formula One, because in the end, we're in show business. If that engine developed all the technical advantages for the road cars, there is another championship called the World Sports uh, Saloon Car Championship, and that's where it should be, not in Formula One. Formula E came to you and said, "Do you want? Are you interested in Formula E?" And you said, "No." Why? Why? Do you regret that decision? Not at all. You think it's doomed? I think the people that are involved in there are more or less got the same feelings as me now. So you think it was it was a and the reason is because there's no engine noise or? No, I think it's. I don't. I don't. I mean, it's not that I'm concerned that they're competitive right. as far as Formula One's concerned. Right. But I don't particularly see what it does that all the other junior formulas can do. Okay. Also so, make a bit of noise. Yeah. And, but you think noise is really important, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, excitement uh, and noise. Who else? Okay, over here. All, all questions are concentrated over here. So. And the back, there's one at the back as well. Can we get a microphone up there, please? There's uh, Jake from Little Black Book. Uh, my question is about, in light of the recent qualifying and how it's kind of not gone as well as you'd like, and we talked a lot about making Formula One more exciting, what kind of other ideas would you have to change the actual practicalities of the race itself? Make well, it I mean, exciting? you probably saw, if you watched the last race, you saw Paul Lewis start at the back of the grid, finish in sixth or seventh, I think. He came through the field. And it was interesting. Can you imagine if there was f four or five Lewises starting something with the 10th position, having to overtake everybody? You'd just have a lot more excitement. So like a well, maybe system? it's going to be all right. Maybe Ferrari get going. If Red Bull, if this Renault engine turns out OK, maybe we'll be back in that position anyway. So you keep the, the, you, you'll keep this going? Stay as we are. You'll stay as we are yeah. and keep going with it? even though it's people are... You think it's a question of getting used to it? No, we're a democracy, unfortunately. I had not noticed that. Having been on the board for 10 years, I did not notice it was a democracy, but, <laughs> but, but um, maybe, maybe we'll come back to that. Uh, right at the back. Um, Mohamed Ahmed, student at Warwick Uni. Um, I just wanted to ask you... Um, when you first started Formula One, how did you make it a platform for other car companies to join you? Why didn't they just, you know, start their own version at the time? What made yours so popular and the one? Don't really catch it. How do we make it more popular? Well, no, it, it was when you started F1, no. why did the manufacturers get you to do it? And why the did teams. they join you? Yeah, yes. Well, you're the talking team. about the manufacturers and the teams, I guess. Is that correct? Um, not just the, I mean, like, what made your platform the one? If you think of it as um, everybody else joining their content to you, why did they choose you and not someone else? Or why weren't there alternatives? Well, I have no idea. I mean, it was it's, a bit, it, you know... I, I owned a team, so I had a bit of influence. But Formula One was going a long time before I got involved. I mean, the, the answer, I think, to the question is it, life was very different. I mean, I remember yeah. I got involved in 69 with Jackie Stewart, or six, 60, yeah, 69, 70, uh, when Jackie would, was winning three world championships. And it was a very different business. I mean, Bernie, the, the guy who could have done the answer to your question, I think, is Mark McCormack could have. Mark and I, as you know, were good friends. Yes. And why didn't Mark do it? I mean, all, I mean sadly... A lot of drivers died. Rint, Revson, Sever, Graham Hill in an aeroplane accident. But all of the drivers that Mark represented died. And being a superstitious bunch, I think that actually... Well, actually, you say that, but, you, you know, you, 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 you twitch at that. But I think actually that had an impact on them. Uh, but it's interesting, he never really got traction, did he? I mean, he represented Jackie, still does. Yeah, he never... never thought about it. Mm. Well, he did. 
you know, I used, used to work for him. He did think about it, but he didn't, he didn't get traction on it. It was very strange because he had golf, he had tennis, he had skiing, he had Jean-Claude Keeley, as you know. I spoke to him on, on a number of occasions about, about doing, doing things together. And it didn't get anywhere. No. And why do you think that was? Because you had NASCAR in, I mean, the natural, you know, as an American, he'd understand. Yeah. And that's a very boring, you know, you just watch yeah. these cars going round and round in there. It's, circuit it's, waiting it's for like a lots of things it just didn't happen in the end. Very interesting. So that's an yeah. It's that a pity, a... really. Uh, one, Martin? Yes, go ahead. Hi. Um, Tim Lefroy from the Advertising Association. Um, Bernie, you've, um, you're a phenomenon, and you've, uh, and you've uh, done huge things and from a UK base. Um, as we're getting towards the end of this session, I wonder if you just would turn the tables on you for a moment um, and ask you to look at the man on your right. Uh, a lot <laughs> of people here in this room work for him. Um, uh, and uh, he is also something of a phenomenon, f phenomenon for the UK. And maybe as a sort of final reflection, say, you put him on your board, what value you think Martin Sorrell oh, to the Jesus. United Kingdom? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> now, Martin's good because he understands most things. Which Not everything, good. but most things. I said most. Yes, you did say most things. <laughs> well, actually, you know, it's what's interesting is when we have a little chat like we did five minutes before we came, came in here, uh, we do have, an, in, in, I, I would say this and say it publicly, an incredible meeting of the minds. There are some things that I violently disagree with, Bernie. I mean, uh, Hitler didn't do good. Um, and, and whilst, you know, one, one can make an argument about Saddam, uh, Vladimir, I think, I think we have treated badly. I mean, just to amplify the point, because I think it's a really important. The fact that no Western leader turned up at Sochi for what was his personal project, and I, I remember they spent a fortune on that opening ceremony and the closing ceremony, and they were magnificently done. And, and it was the, the president, president's detailed involvement, incredibly important. And people like Thomas Bach, you know, who's the head of the IOC, understood its importance, had a couple of extremely difficult and delicate things to do without going into the details. He engaged with Putin, spent time with him, and Putin solved the problems. I mean, coming back a little bit to, to, to it. So one thing to, to learn from that is that communications is always the answer. If you don't communicate, you're finished. If you have some communication, there is some bridge. I'm not suggesting that the Ukraine would have been dealt with uh, in a different way, but you know the fact that world leaders could have been there for 24, 48 hours, engaged with him in a in that context, I think would have been extremely valuable. So, but there are some things that I violently disagree. Obviously, on the the female issue, I I violently disagree with you, but I disagree with you on Brexit. Um, but just to sum up, because we we've, we've been going for an hour. Um, which is what you agreed to do, and thank you once again for doing it. It's very kind of you to do that. But just to sum, sum up, um, sell Formula One to this, this group. What, 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 makes, what makes it special? Because it is really special. It is, you built a, an incredible business. You could, you, even though you don't control it, you do. I mean, I think the reason you make these extreme statements is you're signaling you're in control of it, to be very blunt. And I asked you before we came here, do you regret your trust that sold the company? Do you regret selling F1? And you, you honestly, if I can say so, you said, yes, you do regret it, or that you regret the trust making the decision yeah. to do it. If it was you, you, I wouldn't would, have sold. you wouldn't have sold it. So you think it was a mistake, because you, but you still act as though you are in control. Absolutely. And you think, so sell it to this lot. No, it, it depends, from a sponsorship point of view, I think it depends an awful lot on what people want. I met with somebody this morning that <coughs> came to see one of our guys, and I said, the problem is, this guy that he was talking to is going to tell you what you should have. I said, it's really and truly, like, you're sitting in a restaurant and the metro d coming to you and tell you what you've got to eat. I said, you should tell us what you would like us to do if we can do it to help your company. Because different companies want for sure different things. But then 
then just find it. But, there, but we've got an obligation at Formula One to try and sell, I say sell this, market this in the most effective way. We have to, we have to engage new media, and you've said you're, you're yep. going to do that. And without going into the gory details, Bernie has indicated to me prior to this conversation that they're going to do some pretty exciting things uh, with uh, hardware and software, let's say, in, in new media. So that's number one. There's data that we can provide. We can provide in a much more uh, extensive paper. I mean, you notice that the Trump piece of paper has come out. If you notice, Donald Trump always has a piece of paper. He's written the, the some reason points is on I it. knew somebody might ask a question, and they wouldn't know the answers. There's the answers. Okay. <laughs> so here you go. So here's on on his sheet. Two thousand. This is a Formula One in numbers. Over four hundred million viewers. This is two thousand and fifteen. One of the most watched annual sporting championships globally. Coverage in over 200 territories, 115 broadcast partners, and 41,945 hours of coverage. Digital and social media. 32 million unique users at Formula1.com. More than a billion social media impressions already this season. So that's only the, since the beginning of this year. We've engaged with 21.5 million people on Facebook and generated 10.5 million video views. 2 million Twitter followers. F1 regularly trends as the most popular subject in Twitter, and over 1 million Instagram followers. QED, case proven, they'll all be rushing to your door. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.